Hello everyone, welcome to Homemakers Radio. I hope you get a few things done while you listen today. If you're new here, please click the link in the description below on the channel and go to the page on which I have posted this video so that you can see a summarization and maybe a few photos of the manse. Today I would like to divide the subject matter into three sections and one is preparation for the home for the day and the other is the actual home making maybe a few interesting things and some things from history in fact and then also dealing with people which I have heard is one of everyone's favorites and I am so uh, hoping that you don't fast forward to that part because everything else leads up to that and so for the most important offering that we have is our homes do you know that we live in ultimate freedom even though it might not feel like that at all we live as our own manager of our own time manager of our money manager of our destiny we do not have someone telling us what we can do with our possessions and where we can go and all kinds of things that other people are restricted on because they are tied down to working for an, um, a company, an employer and so we are in the ultimate place to teach our children to use talents, to develop our own talents, to create uh, skills that we may not have had before and to do so many things and and to be happy we have the opportunity to be happy but there are other forces you know that are against us and maybe you won't go through some of the things that our generation went through uh, some of uh, we who are in our vital years uh, have been through being a homemaker that we had to fight off the world with one hand and maintain our homes with the other hand because there was always a battle to discourage us and to make us fear, feel uncertain or make us to feel inadequate in what we were doing. And so I hope that that doesn't happen to you. And of course, this great, uh, whatever they call it, reset and shut down and all that kind of worked against their plans because the powers that be created a homemaker's population that was greater than ever before so now we can start to realize the potential of our houses and our homes and what can be done there there is a teaching uh, center it's a creative center it's a center for hospitality it's a center for so many things and it is such a great place that I am sure people a lot of people do business from their homes but one of the reasons that I say to get up and get dressed and make um, make something of your appearance is because of the greatness of this place that you live in. I've been reading a lot about castles and I have a book on castles and one of the books I have is called Castles from the Air and a castle is just like a name for uh, a home, a type of home. And I've been reading a lot about that and wondering what people did in their daily life, uh, women at home. And there are some books that were written that were about what people did from morning till evening. And that, I think, is one of the reasons we like the books by uh, Elizabeth Gaskell describing Molly's house and describing her day. And But let's go back to getting ready and to preparing yourself. If you have not got dressed yet and you haven't done anything with your hair and you haven't put your smile on, get ready and get started because this, this whenever there's an upset in life and many people are having maybe turmoil at home with, uh, with people who aren't uh, on board with life at home and life in general and are kind of going in the different direction there's sometimes upsetting things that happen but if you have a routine and it starts with your appearance that no matter what no matter what anyone does no matter what bad news you get you just like the people of old and the people that you and I in our vital years remember they would always go uh, the women especially always go and get dressed and get ready for the day no matter what the uh, the big uproar is 
And so that is so important because it sets your pace and it balances your mind. And the other thing I think is part of preparation is your prayer and then a little exercise and go for a stroll 20 minutes before breakfast if you possibly can, the way that uh, the Regency people did and the things that we read about in some of these old books. Now, whether or not it's true, some of it is actually pretty good and workable. And so your preparation should include your appearance, your prayer life, and your exercise find some place you can look and watch and be guided by uh, that's free online to do some exercises that are for beginners and that are merely uh, stress releasing um, stretching beginner exercise type in all those words and you'll find it and it, it also balances your mind and gives you a start, gives you a focus, helps you focus if you have those things. And then the next thing too is to go around the house picking up and decluttering and cleaning up from the front door clockwise all the way around and leaving. I know I always leave the kitchen to last. I don't know why, but now they're saying, you know, start with the kitchen and then you'll have a fresh, uh, that's cleaned up and and you can get around to the rest of the things. Sometimes if you leave the kitchen to last, you just never get out of there. So just have a routine where you walk around the house. And if you don't get out much and you don't get any exercise, I would suggest that after you get yourself prepared or even before, get your exercise clothes on and do a walk through. Walk through the house. Do it every chance you get get up from your seated position if you tend to be a little more uh, casual and walk around as it does it does something to your mind it balances your your mind now I'd like to talk a little bit about homemaking and of course it is work but it is probably the most important thing in the world there's no one that does anything like we do that uh, is so important, uh, molding your own mind through the things that you do and the things that you read. And I'd like to uh, recommend that you do some reading, but be careful what you read. Make sure it has is sound, that it's not uh, too disturbing, and that it betters you, that it lifts you up, that it builds you up. It's the same uh, with people, too. You know, you don't want to be around too many people that are always um, pessimistic. It's not good for you. And so homemaking, the reason that it is so important from from preparing meals to washing dishes, it is so important because it is a type of offering. It's an offering of your willing hands, you know, willing hands and uh, reaching out to care for others around you in that home realm. And I know a lot of people, especially when they're young, they want to be missionaries and they want to go somewhere and help people. The best thing you can do is be a missionary to your own home. To, by your example, show how to keep it, how to take the smallest of cottages, the most humble of places, and make them livable, glorious, beautiful, and where people feel happy. And sometimes I'll get in kind of a, uh, sour mood and I'll think uh, just don't have any motivation and when I move around and start picking stuff up and I'll straighten something up automatically it balances my brain and that and it won't go down into anything darker or more depressing and so it's so important to take time to do this and to do it with to do it so graciously and gracefully that no one really knows that you're keeping house. Now I know in the past I read in an old reader, child's reader that was like for fifth grade and I, I'm not sure who wrote it but it was terrorizing. He was talking about spring cleaning on how women uh, attacked it so viciously and with so much noise and so much commotion that the men had to run away and hide somewhere in the uh, in the writer's cabin behind the house or something like that um, he this one man was describing it as uh, there's water sloshing all over the place and and the broom is 
sweeping up dust and they're shaking out this and shaking out that and the pots and pans are rattling. But I think that you should go through it. See, this is one of the wonderful things about getting dressed up first. No one notices that you're actually working, that this is a work day. You get all dressed up, put your apron on over it and go around and while you're talking to people and asking them how they are and um, discussing ideas and making plans, you can be picking up things and you can be putting things in place. You can even be cleaning up that kitchen. My kitchen is probably the worst thing because we eat at home. We prepare food constantly at home. I've quit using paper products to you know, to make it easier, I've decided just to eat off the dishes. <laughs> and um, and so we do have, and of course, we are, the descendants come. And um, that's why they're called descendants. They descend on you. And so I would just say that dressing up helps make people realize that you're not in a big furor trying to uh, get everything cleaned up. They hardly notice as you kind of waltz through the house gracefully with a, a good attitude and um, put things away and pick things up and uh, and that you don't complain about it. But that's one of the reasons I love uh, the internet so much is because I can listen to something while I work. And that's one of the reasons I'm talking to you. And I'd like to thank you for coming on board and listening today. It's just been great. I always look forward to coming back and I just so appreciate your audience. I, I imagine there's probably a, a, a 20 of you by now <laughs> and I would be very frightened if I thought there was uh, 20,000 or, or a million that would really scare me because then I'd be so daunted by it I would think I've got to be more careful what I say but if you and I were sitting together in a room and having tea we would kind of edit out what each other said and some things wouldn't matter and we would not hold each other accountable for every single thing. We would just enjoy the company. And so another thing I think in homemaking that involves, besides the cleaning, when people think of homemaking, they're always thinking of uh, cleaning up something, work, you know, sweeping, vacuuming, uh, doing laundry, making beds, fixing meals. But there are other aspects of homemaking. And so one of them I'd like to encourage you to do is to take some time out for a quiet little letter or card and uh, I've started making letter paper about this size so that it's, it doesn't look so daunting. You can get quite a bit of a message on this uh, back and front and you can put it in a, reg in a card envelope and there you have written a letter. And I think a lot of the reason people don't write letters is they get these huge pieces of paper and they think that it's just going to be such a job, such a chore. But to take time out to sit down, be still, and be quiet and write a letter. Um, wasn't there a scene in Pride and Prejudice where Darcy was writing to his sister? There are so many aspects in the Jane Austen novels of so many different things, and I really appreciated Brian Kozlowski's book, The Jane Austen Diet, but there needs to be more written, and uh, chapters like Jane Austen writes letters, <laughs> um, and Jane Austen makes, uh, makes you know, something, creates something, and uh, because they did talk a lot about the tapestries and things like that. I do wanted to show you some of these things. So while we're talking about the home. I want to remind you how much history is wrapped up in this home that you're creating and uh, to take your children on a house tour, putting things in place that belonged to you maybe before you had, before they came along or if you can find something else that belonged to someone else in your family, give them a history, give them a home tour of your own home. Now, one of the things that Linda Lichter wrote about in Simple Social Graces, uh, used to be called the Bene Benevolence of Manners, was the history of the Victorian era. I believe that she had gone to work for a newspaper who wanted her to do an article on how much better off women are today than they were in the Victorian era. And in order to find the history of the Victorian era, she started looking at the things that they left behind. 
their houses, their uh, their tapestries, their their clothing, their uh, their house house utensils, home, uh, their furnishings, their letters, their gifts that they made for one another, um, their their hobbies and their talents, their books that they wrote, things like that, rather than looking too much at uh, history books or newspaper articles. And that's how you will make your history. Your, your own things at home creates a history. So I want to show you some history here of, uh, I have uh, some pillowcases. They used to buy these pillowcases and they would just uh, crochet or embroidery a little uh, edging on them. This is what they used. They didn't always use these to sleep on though. They'd put that pillow aside and then get out a regular pillow with just a plain pillowcase to sleep on. Or they would just put these on on Sunday. And so I wanted to show this to you and uh, show you that this is an example of some of the things that they did. And I inherited this from my uh, mother-in-law and I wrote down who gave it to her. It was a wedding present for her and, and one of her sisters made it. So I had it in a little envelope and I wrote down, I write down on the outside of the envelope, you know, who, who it was and what year it was made. And then I have another one here that looks like it was worn uh, quite a bit or else someone bleached it or something but it just looks a little bit uh, it's very thin so they use this a lot but this was made for uh, my mother-in-law's my father-in-law's by my father-in-law's mother so that was quite a while ago since he was born in 19 oh something <laughs> 19 aught something uh, but see, they would have. She, I've saw, seen this on her pillows. It's real thin, so they may have slept on it or something. But he was so proud of it that he wanted her to use it a lot because his mother had made it to, for them for their wedding. And so these are the things that have the history. You have to also make sure maybe get a little tag made that's uh, washable and sew it on the inside somewhere so that it won't be lost. Sometimes you get a piece of paper and it's you put it with something and the paper gets separated or if it's inside of an envelope uh, sometimes things can get uh, departed from one another. So I wanted to show you that these are some of the things but then you have things too. There may be things that you make and it doesn't have to be tapestries, cloths, or anything made out of cloth. But another thing that tells the history of your home uh, and these are some things that I got from her house, from my mother-in-law's house, because she kept things that her mother had given her. <laughs> and things like this that we use decoratively were very important to them. You notice, I always liked it. They had a little uh, hole here in the... But they they were ceramic, but they were... Uh, they had the... These weren't painted on, but they were decals, and they were put in a kiln and made. And they used these. They actually used them. Like she'd put something in it uh, to serve. and They wouldn't use them every day, but it would be like when they had company or Sunday. And they used them because I remember being in her house and she had all the fanciest dishes out. And what was really interesting about her house was she just lived in a real small place of no distinction. And, you know, I complain about the man sometimes because it's so old. Well, this was twice the problem <laughs> as uh as my place very hard for it to look pretty and on sunday she got all this stuff out she laid her pillowcase she put these pillowcases on her bed because the door um was always open and you could see in there and um as as you pass by and so she had all these out she put her put dinner on her best dishes and it was real interesting because if she had a little overflow of company she'd get out a card table which was a folding table and she'd set that out right next to the regular table and which was not much uh, less fancy than the regular dining table and she put a tablecloth on it too and she put the same fancy dishes on it and they got out I still have her actual silverware real silver and they objected strongly 
to the new um, cutlery that had come out that was stainless steel. They No one would ever tell anybody why they objected to it, but they didn't like it. And it had something to do with the value of the silver to your health, something like that. Haven't really looked that up. So I wanted to show you another plate that she had. But they would put they would put their food on it. Actually, maybe not hot food, but uh, so here's another one of the plates that she had. And they only used them for special occasions. They had a like a planer set that they used during the week. And then on this table that she set that was a folding table and she'd put a cloth on everything, this is one of the candle holders someone gave her. Uh, I've never used it, but she had it. She didn't light the candles, but she put a candle in it, or she'd put, uh, you know, flowers in there. And uh, I've never used it like she did, but it was on that table on Sunday. And other than that, their their lives were very plain. And uh, but they, it was very important that for them to have this fanciness around in their in their humble humble house, and. Uh, clothing it was very important for them to have nice clothing though they might be in a, a house that just had no real distinction to it and so I wanted to tell you about that because these this is your history what you do uh, what you collect what you have and what you use is part of your history and I wanted to read something out of simple social graces uh, to you and I want to remind you that everything that you do in the home, whether you're having a hard day and you're having to do catch up on laundry or just, you know, trying to make it look nice and it's hard work and it's labor, that it is an offering. It's an offering of yourself. It's an offering of your talent. It's an offering to God. Uh, also, I think we are here to honor him and to reflect his beauty around us to reflect it in our own lives and and to be and to be as happy as we can now as homemakers life is a little different for for you than it would be for people who aren't really involved too much in actual homemaking because you have to make up your own mind and make decisions yourself whereas if you're at work all the things are laid out for you to do that day and you just go by what someone else has determined that will happen that day and but at home you have to make a lot of decisions for yourself and uh, so it, it is it's daunting plus you'll have people around you that will say very rude things uh, hopefully not but sometimes they'll say very rude things by like well what do you find to do all day and I'll never forget the lady who told me after uh, the last child got married and got their own home um, now that the children are gone what are you going to do have you thought about what you're going to do and she was she had this list of things for me to do she wanted me to go into daycare and then this and then that and then I said no I'm going to have to uh, I could do some something like that and she had suggestions she had jobs it, isn't it interesting they always uh, know more than you do about your life but uh, I said well and I just stood there and orally told her all the things I was behind on I need to paint that wall in the laundry room I need to uh, go through all those uh, books I I need to go through and um, get the children's stuff in their own uh, sections and boxes and stuff so they can take it home and uh, I need to catch up on my correspondence when I get all that done then then come back and talk to me and I also have to paint the outside of the house and uh, so there's so much to do that I don't know how people find time uh, to think about other things so I want to read to you about this, uh, this the cottages and the houses of the Victorian era and the Victorian era I believe was 1901 uh, wait a minute, 18-something to 1903 or something like that. Uh, I used to know that by heart, but as I've gotten more vital, some of these little details, I haven't uh, stored them in my head because I want to make room for more stuff. <laughs> anyway, it, it ended around 1903 when Victoria died, Queen Victoria died. But it's called, uh, the style of the homes is called Gothic Revival. And so I wanted to show you first what those would look like. Now I know you're, you're, you're out there working and you're busy. 
uh, and this is only supposed to be for listening. I realize I have a very harsh back light back there, but I got tired of waiting for the sun to move, and uh, my time was running out. So uh, they call them storybook cottages, but they were more than that. They were beautiful edifices, and and they had uh, they made a human being. Just looking at them makes me feel more dignified and, and human. They had uh, so many, well, it's cataloged in this book called Storybook Cottages. And I've told you about this before, but I want to read to you what Linda Lichter had to say about it, okay? So that you can understand more that the home is not just, a, I know some of you are living in trailers and tents and things that you think are less than ideal, but there's something quite dignified about all of it if you have the right uh, approach to it and the right attitude and the gratefulness and uh, the determination to hang on to it to keep it so that it doesn't fall apart and you'll have it for many years it's called gothic revival the passionless passionless repose of greek revival simple rational lines suited public buildings as aj downing pointed out now aj downing I wanted to tell you who this person was, and I hope that I have marked it here. Goodness, I think I lost it. There were two people that teamed up together to write this book or to create this look. It was Alexander Jackson Downing and somebody else. Um, just hold on, I'll find it here. I had it marked here a while ago, but there were two people, and their names were so similar, I can't even... Uh... It was a carpenter gothic style. It was uh, much loved by car uh, carpenters and, and, and everybody. And the houses were built for the person, not for future sale or for their value or anything like that. They were built for someone's wife or someone's daughter etc. Someone's mother. Um, there were two people involved in this and one of them had been an architect for the government before the Civil War and both of them found themselves needing to uh, find a new new way to to create homes uh, there was Andrew Jackson Downing was one of them. And uh, there was Alexander, somebody else. I'll, I'll write it down in the, uh, in the post so you can see who it was. I'll read about this uh, from Linda Lichter. It says... Uh, the Gothic Revival said that domestic architecture should be less rigidly scientific and it should exhibit more of the freedom of play, of feeling, of everyday life. And this is one of the uh, famous statements by Alexander Jackson Downing. There must be nooks and crannies about where one would have to love to linger. Cozy rooms where all domestic fireside joys are invited to dwell. Have you ever gone into a historic home and for one of those home tours that they have and you've gone up the stairs and there's a landing and it's over and there's a window there and you can sit there and look out the window and uh, there's pauses everywhere you go as things aren't don't go just straight from one room to the other and you turn a corner and there's just a little nook or a cranny where no one can tell you exactly what they used it for but there'd be a, a seat there or just a quiet place to be and, uh, and you know, no matter where you live, you can create that kind of atmosphere. I know just behind the door of this guest room that I'm in, if you'll notice, I've changed it again um, because I'm expecting uh, some descendants. But just behind the door, there's uh, a space uh, that the door doesn't uh, close against. And that's where I can put uh, chairs right next to the bookshelf and you can make a library table there. 
Borrowing designs, history, and folklore from medieval Europe, especially England, Downing became the most eloquent apostle of Gothic revival houses. In contrast to the flat, predictably balanced proportions that characterized the classical, um, it emphasized facades, irregular placement of doors and windows, clustered chimneys, steep gabled roofs, and um, iron tracery, gingerbread scrollwork, and soaring towers. This was a picturesque and contagious style suited to a free-spirited people. Washington Irving revamped his sober 17th century Dutch farmhouse until it seemed to its owner all made up of gable ends and as full of angles and corners as an old cocked hat. The finest Gothic dwellings were sheer enchantments, passports to another place and time. Downing noted that the character expressed by the exterior, exterior of this design is that of a man or family of domestic tastes, but with strong aspirations after something higher than social pleasures. A proper yet affordable home. Downing believed that a proper house had to satisfy all the rational desires of the senses, the affections, and the intellect, yet his books also extensively discussed practical subjects such as lathing, heating, window sashes, and the thickness of floorboards. When he hit the bottom line, money, he paid equal attention to those who had it and those who had to scrimp. He printed plans for both sumptuous villas and modest working men's cottage, cottages of three to four rooms. Because of the democratic spirit of Victorian manners led straight to the hearth, many house pattern books were published for those of limited means. Now, I like that. It should always be a scaled-down style for people like us, where we can have, like, you might look at royalty and see how these uh, modern princesses and queens of different European countries have gorgeous clothes. But, you know, you can get a pattern and get some... Uh, inexpensive cotton and just copy that and you have your your um, scale of it and I think this is good that she has a picture of it here but I will show you some from his book here Downing assured the readers who took his few books through more than 20 editions I, I don't have a, a copy of his any of his books I only have a book written about him um, he assured them that the peculiar charm of a cottage is as great as that of a villa, and he made good on his promise. A generation before William Morris, he advocated melding the useful and the beautiful. He showed how even a tight budget could stretch to the charm of bay windows, gabled and bracketed roofs, beckoning porches and vine-covered trellises. You can have all that. You can have the vine-covered trellises. Uh, trellises are very cheap. And uh, you can grow a vine on it. You can have uh, uh, the gingerbread trim. You can buy pieces and just nail them up there. That's what I've done here. I haven't showed you much of the outside, but I've done a few things out there uh, for a little or nothing. Um, so what now seems like frills... We, we look at it in such a practical manner, but what seems like frills were then considered essentials. Downing wrote, There is no building, however simple, to which either good forms or something of an agreeable expression may not be given. Of course, he never saw tract housing. Victorian architecture was not just structure and style, but an encounter with the soul. soul. That is why Downing argued that every house must have something in its aspect which the heart can fasten upon and become attached to, as naturally as the ivy attaches itself to the antique wall, preserving its memories from decay. So that, those are just some examples of how we can look at our homes differently is that's why I thought that in the 80s uh, before I was so vital uh, the interior decor did interior decoration and inter home interiors came around and it was a company that could offer the average person or the very low income something that would embellish their home and make it a a, a prettier place and a happier place and make you feel like you had something we cherished all the things that we bought from those that company because it was the first time many of us had ever had a picture, a candle holder, a wrought iron shelf, uh, just these, and, and it was always in sets. 
so that it looked coordinated on your walls. Lighting, candle holders, things that we didn't actually put the candles in them, but they were elegant. They were beautiful. And it was first time many of us had an opportunity to do more in our houses besides just have furniture. And those things were of such high quality. And it helped the homemaker that lived in the humblest home um, just be more motivated and happy at home and more content. So I'm going to show you some of the uh, colored pictures of these homes. Now this is the inside. What he would do is take the inside of real um, antique, what you would call antiquities houses and copy them and make uh, something beautiful in a, on a lower, smaller scale. So, and if you'll go to the oldest part of your town, you're going to find some of those around, plus shops and little storefronts that are very similar. There's one by the ocean there. And uh, the thing that I liked most about some of these homes, these little cottages, was that the windows were often recessed so that they weren't hit suddenly by, you know, so easily by wind. There's one up here that I like. Uh, the windows wear out here in this area where I live. Unless you have a porch covering things or a little roof over the windows. And that's the one thing I noticed that they were more, more careful about. Now, I also have a few things to talk about in the area of people. <laughs> so you're going to be dealing with people. Now I've established that your home is a historical place. Uh, and if you can stay in the same place, it's amazing how you might think, oh, we're going to move up from here. We're going to do a great job. And I would recommend everybody have a goal of doing a little better and you know, buying the home they really want. I really would recommend. But in the meantime, to prepare for that, take real good of care of what you have, even if you live in a yurt. Take good care of it and uh, get in some really good housekeeping habits. Fold things, put them away immediately. Don't let things pile up because if you, when you finally get to the home you really, really want, you'll still have those bad habits. And it could be just as upsetting to live there as it is in your your small um, your small holiday trailer or wherever it is that you live. So get in some really really good habits because you'll notice in these places in these small places and especially older homes that uh, the clutter is you've just got to control it constantly. You set something down, everything has to be strategically placed or set down, and. Uh, I noticed uh, when my children were little that the best way to, I always wanted to have a coffee table and things out on it, but you can't when you've got little toddlers around and they want their toys up there and they've got to have uh, free reign. I always believed they had to have free reign of their own home. And so what I started doing, that's why I liked home interiors is things just went on the wall. Nobody can mess with that. No one can get up there and get that. And I still have some of it around here. So let's talk about people and uh, why the homemaker has to know about this is because there's always someone around who um, we've got to avoid the people that um, can discourage us. And it can come from anywhere. Uh, it doesn't even have to be in your own home, but be remarks that people might make and make you feel uh, insignificant, which of course we know that our our uh, identity is in Christ and but it is quite daunting sometimes when you run into in the old days you run into somebody that or you knew someone who was just kind of a pain to have around because they're just foolish or they uh, they don't uh, they're just kind of a drag we used to call used to say um, and uh, and they've always they've always been those kind of people. And as I've talked to my grandson, he'll tell me his history, and describe um, people that are recorded in history. And I'll say, oh, that sounds like you know someone that uh, that friends of mine talk about that uh, they don't like to be around her too much because she contradicts all the time or she talks back. Um, but uh, because I remember. One politician back in the day described 
Karl Marx is someone who would argue with you about everything. Even if you said good day, he would argue with you about it. Uh, and we have those people, you know, sometimes whole villages can be like that. And so, but now I think uh, we have a more controlling people. These are people that are ready to get you in an argument at anything, anything at all. Plus, they want to control you. And um, if you say something or if you object to something, they will say, prove to me that you cannot do that or prove to me that that's bad for you. Maybe they're promoting some kind of life philosophy and uh, you'll object to it and tell them that's not good for you or good for them or that uh, it, it isn't sound doctrine or something like that. And they'll say, well, prove that it isn't. Uh, prove to me that what you're saying is right. And so what we need to do, because what they are is they're very controlling and they want you to spend a lot of time researching your belief to prove to them something. What I have found to be better is to for you to respond back to them. You prove to me uh, that you're that that it's not. You know, you you prove to me that just go the opposite. Um, for instance, they will say, "Well, prove to me that what you're saying is right." You say, "You prove to me that what I'm saying is not," and let them let the burden of a uh, proving be on them because they can really take a lot of time but they're they become more controlling today i think it used to be you knew which ones to people to avoid were bad influences or um were discouraging but today people are more controlling i think and they're trying to get uh, you away from your family or your family away from you um, they want to control what you do, they want to control your knowledge, and they want to control what you say and, and what you believe. So the best thing to do with these people is just to ask the question back. When you sense you're being controlled, um, to ask the question back. So I wanted to also mention, when I was talking to, uh, previously, when we first opened up here today on Homemaker, Makers Radio, um, about getting dressed and in Linda Linda Lichter's book she had written a, a section on clothing on the uh, the Victorians and their clothing now of course no era is all its own era it draws from the era before it like you might say 1950s was wonderful but actually 1950s was full of 1940s and 1930s things and uh, they inherited a lot of it and uh, so she wrote in her book a section on their clothing and she covered the men's clothing the women's clothing and the children's clothing and one of the things that she said was that clothing suited the activity and the surroundings and so no woman was no one was ever embarrassed it was neither too ostentatious nor too dull and i noticed this uh, a lot of uh, we vital people from the 1950s we had an, uh, a heart for that, even though we had never been taught it and we did not know much about the past. We didn't, actually, I didn't even know about the Victorian era as a whole um, until homeschooling and we had uh, a book about it and uh, I knew nothing about it because our history was very limited in the public school. They only tell you, you know, they'd tell us uh, maybe the last 30 years or something like that. They tell you, but make sure they tell you about the two world wars and about how um, scared we should be that we're going to be attacked by somebody. <laughs> and um, But this, the whole beauty and fulfillment of learning about the, the previous era, the Victorian era, that would be also include the era when people came out west um, on their wagon tra trains and many inventions, hundreds of inventions at the time, including the sewing machine. And uh, so uh, we all got, even though when we grew up, we grew up in the wilderness, on the homesteads in Alaska, we had, an, we had a feeling for the mood of the day, the weather, uh, the, the activity, and the surroundings. And um, I know I remember a lady telling me she had a berry picking dress. <laughs> she she wore this uh, 
kind of a frock or something that she wore into well she and her children were picking berries on their own property and uh they, everything had a, a purpose and a reason and a mood and i noticed this when one of my granddaughters comes and she likes to sew freehand just take a swath of fabric kind of measure it around her cut it sew it and but it's all about what the next day we're going to be doing or what the weather is like or what and, and she's inspired by the colors. She'll pick out something because it has uh, green in it with uh, with red flowers in it. And it reminds her of what's going on outside. And so we all have to develop this mood for clothing. Because they, she said in this book, clothes always suited the activity and the surroundings. It's been a long time since I have seen people at the beach, especially women. Women uh, valued that experience so much that they had uh, special beach clothing that might have a, a, a special print on it that was like the ocean or kind of went with that area and uh, they'd have a, a beach hat and a beach this and a beach that and it was all very special to them now everyone is so casual that you, that they almost intimidate others if they want to make it a special occasion you're almost intimidating like who do you think you are what are you all dressed up for you know everybody has to be casual and it's almost like there's an intimidation campaign going on if people want to make life a little more special and so this is one of the things that you have to worry about or you have to kind of watch for with people if you're because you as a homemaker are dealing with people maybe you'd like your house to look nice you'd like to get a tea set out and somebody tells you you're being too sophisticated or maybe uh you're acting out of uh what what are some of the old uh books that uh, i've read that said don't get above your station you know and uh so you have to really watch for this and remember this is your home these are your people and I think that you should make sure that you concentrate on your own people. This is what helps a family, a nation, and a church more than anything. Concentrate on your people. Bring out the best in them and encourage them. Mr. S. did something very interesting a few months ago, and he's continued until this time, and I, other people have picked up the habit, too. And that is um, the opening prayer in church. Usually they uh, ask some man to uh, to do it. And uh, Mr. S. did it once. He said uh, he prayed uh, a prayer for every church member who had lost a, a child or grandchild or relative to the world. In other words, they're not interested in uh, the Lord anymore. They've rejected the Christian life and and are living dangerously, I mean quite dangerously, both for their health and their soul. Uh, and then um, my uh, my son-in-law did the same thing, prayed for every single member of the church that had lost someone. And most people do not want to talk about it because, it, especially mothers, they feel it's a reflection and they know that uh, other people will judge them. They'll say, well, they ran off because you were too strict or you didn't, you weren't uh, religious enough or you weren't this or you weren't that. Well, we decided uh, we're praying for your children, no judgment, <laughs> because there's another hand out there pulling people's children away. And so that's why I say you're the homemaker. This is your family. These are your people. Make sure you spend a lot of time praying for them and talking to them about if you're homeschooling, you can't just give them books and say, oh, I'm homeschooling. You read this, you read this and answer the question and stuff. You've got to remind them daily why you're homeschooling them because there is a purpose in it. And it is to make yourself distinct from everybody else. You're not going through a learning factory. You don't want to come out the same as everyone else. You're not going to be dressing like them, speaking like them. You're going to be different than the world. And you're also going to raise up some really good uh, intelligence and talents that they uh, in the world are rather dumbed down. They also are going to try to bring everyone down who tries to rise above it tries to rise above mediocrity so don't just 
say I'm homeschooling my kids and, and I'm going to be a teacher and I'm just teaching them this and this and all these facts. Remember that poem I often quote, keep on uh, fill his head full of figures and facts, keep on, keep on uh, jamming them in till it cracks. And uh, uh, remember that there is a purpose. It's your family. You want to preserve your family. Teach them about their own history. Teach them who their grandmother was, their great-grandmother was, great-grandmother. And if you've got things around that belong to them, teach them a little bit about, about them, how they lived. You might think, oh, it has nothing to do with us, especially those of us in the West where we're told uh, it's a new beginning and it's a frontier land and uh, we shouldn't care about those things. That's not true at all uh, because you can't be detached too detached. Now, I know that it's hard for some people, but we have to know, you know, that life doesn't just uh, start. We didn't invent ourselves. And so I think it's really important. Care about your family. Care about the house they live in. And care about your own development and your own health. I've been recently studying about uh, the difference between uh, chemical medicine and natural medicine and what the effect it has on your mind and body. And as far as you can, stay close to what God gave you, you know, who was it that said, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food? And uh, I've even started wearing it on my face. <laughs> you know, my mother took, uh, she used to make her own jam. And of course, there's always the pulp left over from the jam. And she would use that as a facial mask. She never threw anything away right away and uh, gave herself beauty treatments. And so take care of yourself, take care of your family, take care of your house your spiritual life, pray for every single member of your family. Now, some of you who have, quote, lost one or two that decided to take off and, and go visit uh, the world, so to speak, you need to make sure that you pray for the ones that are left, the ones that are home, because uh, a child can pick up on the mother's grief for someone who has just kind of... Uh, neglected the family and decided they don't want to speak to them anymore. Uh, they can pick up on that grief and the mother needs to not waste her years uh, grieving over one that's not going to come back, that's rebelled, and start loving the other ones that are left. Make sure that you do that. And those of you who live alone and are alone, you have a purpose too. And the home and the dwelling that you live in and your appearance and the way you speak and the things that you read, the things that you, how you develop your mind are very, very important. I do appreciate you all being here and listening and I hope you got quite a bit done and that you find a mighty purpose in your home and that it's not something that you're just trying to do to get by but that has a strong purpose for it. And so I hope to talk to you again soon. I am still trying to get back to being more regular with these broadcasts if they're helpful to you. And I do appreciate all those of you who are helping me and who are encouraging me and leaving comments over on the page where I have posted this. So God bless you all. Stay close to Christ. We'll talk to you later. Bye.